Hello, I'm B.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. After the yelling and screaming of this election, we thought we'd have a little change of pace uh, and of intelligence. Uh, I'm here talking with, and we'll be delighted to talk with all for about half an hour or so, with old friend and colleague, uh, uh, the philosopher and ethicist, Joan Gibson. Uh, Joan is uh, has retired as a founder and director of the University of New Mexico's Health Sciences Ethics Program. Uh, she served for 20 years as the chair of a hospital ethics committee in Albuquerque and is probably the most famous ethicist in New Mexico because there aren't a great many of them, but also because she is a magnificent, clear-headed, wonderful thinker. Uh, she's now a consultant in applied ethics, bioethics, and value-based decision-making. She's just written a tremendously useful book called Pause, uh, How to Turn Tough Choices into Strong Decisions. It's really one of those books that, that, that is so clear-headed and so concise, uh, but so deep at the same time that, that um, I really recommend it highly. So we'll talk today about her book and about something else on her mind called advanced care planning using a life, a life cycle model. And then if we're lucky, we have a little time, Joan's going to reflect a little bit on the current state of health care in New Mexico and the United States. So it's wonderful to have you here with us. It's great to be here, Barrett. Um, <clears throat> I, I think you're absolutely right. 30 minutes is a fairly short period of time in which to cover the meaning of life or what would take even longer were the, the questions that you that you posed. And you have to remember that by training, I'm a philosopher. And what that means is we are paid by the word. And the longer the word, the more we're paid. And so I think in a way, pause was my attempt to um, do just the opposite, uh, to see if I could say what really matters in as few and simple and accessible words as possible. So thank you for your kind words about that. Well, we're going to try to go for a little longer than 30 minutes. Okay. Just <laughs> so could you sort of, uh, and this is an awful thing to ask an author to do to sort of wrap up your book, and, but could you sort of <clears throat> sort of give us the essence of this thing? Because it has a wonderful worksheet in the back. It has it has very important questions that we all should ask ourselves in making hard choices. But if you could sort of summarize it, if you will, I'd be glad to. It may take twenty six or twenty seven <laughs> words, not just uh, not just twenty five. In the um, <clears throat> mid eighties, I started sharing the uh, ethics committee at what was then St. Joseph Hospital. And I was still teaching philosophy first time and using lots of big words. And um, the mid 80s was the time when <clears throat> decision making, <clears throat> excuse me, decision making in healthcare was clearly beginning to be seen as incredibly complicated and definitely interdisciplinary. Mm. On top of that, we were now faced with medical interventions that could keep us going much longer than was ever before possible. And so we were faced with uh, making really tough, high-stakes decisions, i.e., does somebody live or die? And we began to focus what we understood about decision-making in this arena. Uh, ethics committees uh, were essentially mandated, either ethics committees or ethics consultants, were mandated, I believe it was in the late 80s, um, the, the, the Danforth Act required that institutions receiving uh, federal funds had to have some resource available to patients, families, physicians, nurses 
to help them, if they so requested it, to help them with these difficult decisions. So this high stakes decision making where heat is high, sometimes light is low, many different voices, many different values uh, were coming together and the decisions really mattered. <clears throat> so for the last 25 years, I've been interested in how it is we actually do make decisions, not how should we, but what actually goes on in the brain as we um, approach these very difficult decisions. And so a colleague and I, Mark Bennett, who is a, a mediator and um, uh, a very thoughtful person around decision making, uh, we began to develop a system <clears throat> for making difficult decisions huh. that we hoped would actually map what we do, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. So what we tried to do is shine a light on what actually goes on and then give folks uh, a chance to pause at each stage along that way, understand what is happening and um, become better at each of those sort of automatically recurring steps as we make those decisions. And this book is a final attempt to distill that process, uh, use language that is helpful to people, and shows folks how actually, when faced with difficult decisions in their own personal lives, some of it very ordinary, very common, some of it really high stakes, how to become better at what it is we already do when we make these decisions. This book, I hope, is a simple handbook that folks can use when faced with those daily decisions. So the book is divided up in, into basically uh, four chapters or four big subheadings, seeing, believing, and doing, which I thought was just wonderful. Seeing where am I, where are you, what matters, what matters most, why, must it hurt, these are wonderful things. What are my choices, what fits, what do I say? These are, these are the key. so could you talk a little bit about seeing and believing and doing? I think they're... It's just so clear. I think without um, understanding uh, what we now know about cognitive science and how the brain works, Mark and I, back in the late 80s and early 90s when we first started this, when we observed how it is that we and others make decisions, saw several things. The first is, and I think folks have known this for a long, long time, when an issue presents itself, the first thing we do is frame it. We can't even uh, deal with it until we have somehow focused on it. It's as if the brain has lenses, like your glasses, and those lenses bring into some kind of focus that issue. Sometimes we call it framing. I've tried to um, uh, approach it with the trigger question, where am I? Yeah, right. And the, the image that, that, that I like to use is a, a difficult decision. How do I talk to my mother about not driving her car anymore? Yes. Um, so my first question is, so where am I? How am I framing this? And there are no good, bad, right, wrong answers, but simply a kind of self-awareness of where am I standing on this multi-story building looking down on this issue, which is the courtyard. Now, I'm standing here looking down. My mother is not standing in that same place. She is standing somewhere very, very different. Her angle of vision, her perspective is quite different than mine. Other folks on the freeway are standing yet again 
in a very different place looking down on the courtyard. So this first seeing, where am I, where are you, builds on the cognitive neural reality, if you will, that each of us initially, before we do anything else, focuses on and frames an issue in a certain way. We can't help <clears throat> but do that. So the task is to see how are we doing it? How are we framing it? Why am I framing it in this way? And then also pausing and inviting others to explain how they are framing it. Because each of us is going through that same process with very different results. That's the seeing part, if you will. And that is essential, absolutely essential. Socrates said, first know yourself. So this whole idea of, you know, each of us is on a different hill. And we all see things differently. We are, even twins, even identical twins, turn out to be oftentimes very different people mm -hmm. because of a slight change of perspective. It's so important to see where that is. And I love that image of the building. Your mom's over here, you're up here, and the drivers are over here. They were the two angel men. Let's we unless, hope not. <laughs> let's don't let me hope not. Yes, go back. But so so when we when we think about believing now, um, and what matters most, um, this I think is always um, is always the hardest the hardest question to sift through that priority of values. The um, next set of activities. <clears throat> builds on an observation which then has become an, an assumption in Marx and my work. And that is anytime we um, are faced with a decision, there are things that matter to us. Uh, that um, there, when you make a decision, you do so because something matters to you. Either something pulls you or pushes you. There is no such thing as a value-neutral decision. And I will tell you, when I use the word value, I, I really mean nothing more, nothing less than whatever matters. So what you need to do is, when you're faced with this, how do I talk to my mother? Um, what's important here from my perspective, from her perspective, from other people's perspective? So things that matter are um, my relationship with her, her safety, the safety of other folks on the freeway, her independence, respect for her. So taking some time, again, pausing to invite others, especially if you're lucky enough to have them together, to reflect on and answer the question, so what matters here? In no special order. But what matters here without jargon? Now, I come from philosophy, and, and much of what's happened over the decades is, is couched in these fancy phrases like, oh, my mother's autonomy, and, um, you know, uh, preventing harm to others, etc. I think we get much richer information if we encourage people to use everyday language. So what's important to you here? And the way you do that is what Martin Buber taught us, which is using dialogue. Now, in my profession, in the medical profession, and in a lot of our culture, we value what I call serial monologues. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you speak your beautiful script. Uh, I, if I'm polite, wait until you're done. But of course, while you're talking, I'm not really listening. I'm preparing <laughs> my script, my monologue, my rebuttal, my critique. And Martin Buber says, you know, um, holding oneself open to the possibility that I just might be changed by what I hear you say. Mm. That's his definition of dialogue. Mm. So the process involved in asking people what matters to them and listening to what they say, it's in that process that you begin to grow an understanding of what in that situation matters. Of course, if you let this run, you realize, oh my gosh, I can't honor 
all the things that matter to everybody at the same time. I can't fully respect and honor my mother's independence, people's safety, my relationship with her. I'm going to have to begin to prioritize. And the way I do that is by saying, okay, these are all things that matter. What matters most? What matters most? And the reason you do that is because there should be a top value or values that you will use then to point yourself in the direction of your decision. It's your guiding star. There are all these other beautiful stars in the night sky. They all have a real attraction, but they you can't navigate by following all of them at the same time. You've got to find that North Star. What matters most to me as I contemplate this decision about whether to speak to mom about not driving anymore? That's the, that's the, uh, the believing part. What matters most? The third chapter is about doing. It's about making the decisions and then carrying out the actions of those decisions. It's always the, always the tough part because actually I suppose when you act, you are also making many, many other decisions. This whole process moves along and sort of cycle through it all, all over again. So when, when you talk about um, what are my choices, um, that seems like it's a very difficult thing to actually, I mean it's very hard to do alone. It's, about, it's a lot easier to do with other people I think because they have different perspectives on what choice might be. But how does one assess choice? Yeah, you're absolutely right. When when I'm doing a training around this, people just have a great time with the first two categories, the the seeing and the believing and talking about what matters. But then you begin to ask them to leave some things by the wayside that matter to them. Mm. And you begin to <clears throat> experience this discomfort of, you know, there are some things that really matter to me but I can't honor them. Um, and so the discomfort begins. Um, and the sense of, oh my gosh, I've really got to make a commitment here. You know, I've got to actually do this. And especially for those of us in philosophy who just love to talk about stuff, all of a sudden we are um, uh, being forced to commit to something. And that's what I really learned in the hospital ethics committee. You know, when you have somebody in the ICU on a ventilator, or my mother is saying she is going to drive herself tomorrow morning at age 89 on the freeway to Santa Fe because she's going to get acupuncture for her macular degeneration, um, you know, I've got to do something about this. I can sit there and worry about safety and respect and independence, but either I intervene and we have a discussion about whether she should be driving herself to Santa Fe or not. Uh, the person on the ventilator, <clears throat> we're either going to decide yes or no uh, to keep that person on the ventilator. So the doing becomes really important. You have prioritized your values. You've decided what's most important, perhaps, is the patient's prior wishes. You may have decided, as I did, that what's most important is my respect for my mom, my respect for her and our, what I think is very healthy relationship. So, what what are the options? You know, what, what are, without deciding what to do, what, what are some of the choices? And here you, you generate options. Um, in the ICU, you, you know, it's pretty much either you <clears throat> leave the person on the vent or you take them off, or you leave them on the vent for a week while you do some other thinking, talking, etc. With my mom, um, either I don't say a thing or I go and talk to her. And then if I go and talk to her, what is the, the nature of the conversation? So you just begin to generate some practical, well, here's some various things I could do. At which point you go back to your guiding star, what matters most to you, 
and you look at those options and you see where does it fit best where is there true alignment between what I said matters most to me and these various options and you use that as a kind of test for which option most aligns with what you have said is most important. So in the ICU, if the patient said, uh, what matters most to me is if the condition that I'm in is irreversible, uh, permanent, and there is no chance that I'm going to come back as a sentient being, please stop um, whatever treatment is keeping my body moving on. And even if family members disagree, if what you've said is most important is to follow the patient's wishes, you do that. If, on the other hand, you've said, <clears throat> well, we want everybody to agree, then you go somewhere else. With my mom, I decided that what was most important was um, my respect for her as really a self-determining individual. And that meant that I needed to go and talk to her. I needed to be honest. What it meant to me to respect her was to um, be honest, be transparent. And so I did. I went and talked to her and I said, this is really tough um, because I'm your daughter, you're my mom. Uh, it would not be fair to you were I not really candid with you about my concern about this. It's your decision. Um, my calendar is clear, and if you'd like, I would be delighted to drive you to Santa Fe. Your decision. And she was immensely relieved and said, I know you're busy. I know you had some talks tomorrow. Uh, this just makes me feel a lot better. Thank you very much. So those are just some examples, yeah, yeah. the doing part. <clears throat> but of course, um, going back to what matters most, there are all these other things that matter that uh, are still there. And they need to be respected and acknowledged. Had she not said, yes, you may drive me, if I was really honest about letting her make the decision, the safety of other people and her peop and her safety were still at risk. Yeah. And that's the downside. Every tough decision, every strong decision has a downside. It has a downside because there are these other things you've identified as important that you've had to leave by the wayside, maybe even violate, you know, gone beyond just compromising. Good decisions have downsides, which brings us to the last part, which you mentioned. So many good decisions never get communicated. So many good decisions in the government, corporate, community worlds, where people have struggled and made really good decisions, are never communicated. So if for people who've been in the work world who receive the memo, <clears throat> it has been decided that, go forth and implement the decision, you know, the folks have no idea how the leaders made those decisions. Yeah, yeah. They had no idea what they struggled with. They had no idea of the downsides that the leaders themselves um, are quite aware of. And there is this, I think, absolutely ill-conceived, wrong belief that you don't want to give your adversaries any more ammunition. Well, <clears throat> you know, your adversaries are basically not all dumb. And um, imagine yourself listening, and you're not necessarily an adversary, but you are explaining to me what your decision is, and you don't even mention the downsides. In the audience, I'm thinking, okay, either he didn't do his homework, you know, he didn't think about what the consequences were going to be, or even worse, he doesn't care. Yeah. And so the people who love us are going to love us regardless of what we do. The people who detest us are going to detest us no matter what we do. But most folks 
simply would like to be treated respectfully as adults, and they would like to hear honestly, so when you made this tough decision, what don't you like about it? What are the downsides? Be honest with us. Why did you do that? What was your top value? Well, that might not have been mine, but I see that if this is your top value, your decision flows honestly from that top value. And I at least respect the integrity of that decision, and I'm willing to impute to you a bit of integrity as well. And I think that's really important. <clears throat> I think politicians, I don't, I have, I would not go near the political world these days and assume that if we just did this, everything would be sweetness and light. But I will say, I, I wish when a, a politician whom I respect has made a tough decision, I wish she or he would say at some point, you know, let me tell you what I don't like about this. Let me tell you what really mm -hmm. kept me up at night. And here's why I regrettably chose to leave some of these values by the wayside and go with this one. I mean, for me, <clears throat> that would go, <clears throat> excuse me, a huge distance um, in at least letting me into the window of the decision-making process, which I think a lot of decision-makers, you know, really do go through. But uh, absent that, believe me, <clears throat> I'm going to impute all the nefarious motives <laughs> I can to my adversaries. Um, and I'm not sure that, that today's politics is, is the place where you start with something like that. But certainly in community discussions, in neighborhood discussions, in family discussions, having this kind of dialogue and, and really asking somebody, especially somebody who holds a different position. So, you know, talk to me about that a bit. Where, where does that come from? Tell me what really matters to you, rather than just having these tips of icebergs bumping into each other without any idea of what is beneath the surface and really holding up those positions. In trying to decide I'm trying to apply, let's say, a life cycle model to advanced care planning. Uh, these principles are all are at work. And if one, I suppose, is this, let me just try this out on you. If, if one is thinking about advanced care planning much of one's life, one is looking at the temporal, at the different temporal hills one lives on as, as one matures. So one is accumulating perspectives that is probably more accurate in toto than, say, for instance, just one hill at the end of your life. Is that sort of what's... <clears throat> that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a very good model. This is just a little sidebar here. My mother-in-law, <clears throat> Mickey, who died several years ago at the age of 90, was a mountain climber in her uh, youth. And her dying process was, was actually quite similar to many of her uh, early summits, if you will. <clears throat> Some of us just go out smoothly, but as, as we were with Mickey and she was dying, uh, we would think, okay, this is it. You know, she's reached that last summit and we'd all take a big sigh of relief. But then it was clear, nope, she's got another one to go on. <laughs> and she was going up and up. But let me, uh, let me get back to your, to your question. You know, you're referring to something that you and I had talked about. Uh, the Institute of Medicine just last month issued this fabulous, fabulous uh, report on dying in America, which um, looks at end-of-life care across the spectrum. And I must say, in virtually every area, we really come up wanting. But in the middle of this report is something that, that I pulled out that just resonated with me profoundly. And because it, it, it I think, fits with this decision-making process, it, it recognizes that with respect to health care and, and our health and what matters to us, 
that we are constantly changing in our situations and what matters to us around health changes because of that, because of our circumstances. Uh, we oftentimes don't ask people to really sit down and think about what matters to them until they're hit with something like my husband Mike's diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis at age 32. I mean, that was a wake-up call. We certainly had not thought about what mattered to us until that hit. <clears throat> Many people who are blessed with good health most of their lives, uh, it's not until they get into their 60s or 70s that they really begin to look at what's important. And with the myriad um, interventions that are available, how do you decide? Whoa cost, effect, prognosis. I mean, it is overwhelming. Um, had we learned at much earlier ages how to pause, look around, um, see the kinds of decisions that are likely predictable, um, <clears throat> maybe have a conversation with people who might be in a position with assisting us, or even if we are not able to make our own decisions, having to make them for us, um, what do we want? What matters to us? I love this notion. Number one, it takes it out of the realm entirely of death and dying. You know, for years, you wouldn't think about this until you went into the hospital for some procedure. You're handed an advanced directive form, which essentially says, we're glad you're here. Now, if you die, how do you want to do it? I mean, that is how people really um, <clears throat> characterize advanced care planning. So what this model says is, look, at least at age 16, when you sign your driver's license, and there's a little box that you are invited to check if you want to. Do you want to be an organ donor or not? What does that mean? Yes. What does that mean? How do you make that decision? With whom should you have that conversation? So with a 16-year-old, that is a perfect time to say, so, you know, what do you think about that? What does it mean? My late husband, Mike, um, five years ago, received a kidney. And I have a picture of the young 17-year-old who was the donor of his kidney. Wow. Riding his mountain bike, running into a tree. Oh, God. Not what any of us planned, but it happened. Now, we really do not want to think about and talk about with those young people in our lives that level of tragedy you know, it's probably something we should do, but there's a much more common way of dealing with this, which is, you know, just kind of take a look around. What matters to you? You're 16. You're driving a car. <clears throat> At various stages in our lives, risks change, and the locus of responsibility changes. And as that happens, we, you know, we can sort of mark those Driver's license, you turn age 18, you leave home to go away to school, to get married, go in the military, um, you have a baby, you have your first surgery, you have your first diagnosis of um, some kind of chronic condition that you wish you didn't have, but you realize that your life is going to, in, in some ways, really be influenced by that all throughout life. There are these moments where if we develop the capacity and the skill to take stock of ourselves, have a conversation with others. Well, let me just tell you what I'm thinking about here. Naming somebody, listen, if something happens and for a period of time I can't speak for myself, I want you to be my health care decision maker. It's very easy to do in New Mexico and in virtually every state to name somebody to have your health care proxy. And here's what I'd like you to know about me. We can do that. And it doesn't have to be at age 70 or 80. It doesn't have to be simply do I want to be on a ventilator or not or have a nasogastric tube. It is, you know, my health and my wholeness really depends 
on the quality of the decisions that I make at each step along the way. And I can't always do it by myself. And I certainly can't do it well or have others do it well if I am silent about what matters to me. So start talking now. Extremely good advice. Makes a huge amount of sense. Makes a huge amount of sense, it does. And no, I'm looking at our at our I'm little talking. clock on the wall. Yeah. I now that I have you here, I want to ask you some questions, or or at least one one larger one about the state of health care in the United States and New Mexico at the moment. Any one of us who's been so unfortunate as to have to go to an emergency room uh, and wait for nine or ten hours and be charged 1300 bucks for, uh, 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 for some nurse to say, here, take this pill, uh, ha has a sense that, that this, is not, this is not working well. So from a philosophical and an ethical, and I know you worked a long time with healthcare management and with uh, national healthcare planning and all kinds of other things a you know, uh, long time ago in the first Clinton administration. Um, it is a matter of money. It is a matter of resources. Is it also a matter of philosophy? I mean, how do you get, how do you get an ER, an ER to work in a compassion, effective, efficient, realistic way? Um, Somebody was reminding me the other day. William Mansfield, years ago, was the master of the short answer. Whereas today, politicians go on and on and on. A journalist, a reporter, would ask him a question, and he would think about it, and he would say, "No." <laughs> this is my. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> or I would say it's complicated. However, uh, because I don't have <clears throat> that uh, DNA gene for brevity in me. Uh, my short answer is. Um, we've got to stop using ERs in the way that we're currently using them. I mean, yes, that's just a very practical. Yeah, and so all the things for which we use the ER, uh, we need to take care of uh, in, in other ways so that that is not the first place that you go uh, for care. It is inefficient. It delivers bad health care. If you're having a heart attack, you want to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but if you've got a bad sore throat or a high fever, you know, there need to be those other places, the primary care places. Ah, oh, golly, I don't know um, where to start. The financing part, I think people have talked to death. I really do believe that the Affordable Care Act is like turning an aircraft carrier. Yeah. I think, you know, if you can just begin to turn it, this is a good thing, and I think the Affordable Health Care Act begins to turn the aircraft carrier in the, the area of financing to align our financing mechanisms with behaviors that we know produce better health outcomes. Um, multiple tests, um, multiple... MRIs, CAT scans, um, are not behaviors that produce better health outcomes. Um, uh, we have, um, you know, a, a discontinuity in healthcare delivery of, I think, pathological dimensions. Um, and it's hard to know which causes which, but if you get paid more for doing more things, if you get paid less for talking and listening, um, it is for those people who want to talk and listen and really become good diagnosticians, um, that is uh, really a, a bootless enterprise. So I think the Affordable Care Act is beginning to identify evidence-based um, practices which, if you then align the financial incentives to that, may actually uh, produce um, uh, better health outcomes the cultural, the political, the traditional forces, the individualistic, 
ideology that is so much a part of, at least part of our American heritage, is built into uh, the delivery of medicine. I believe, too, this notion of American exceptionalism, that, my gosh, because we're Americans, we must have the best healthcare system in the world, and by virtual every study, uh, we see that is not the case. If you have a heart attack and happen to be close to, or stroke, and happen to be close to a really good facility, you know, that's great. But for the vast majority of the things that we need, um, it is it is simply not the case. Let me pick one thing out which certainly affects people our age. I'm 70. Uh, another misalignment is that um, as we get older, what we need are not so much medical interventions, but we need support. We need help with activities of daily living folks that can just kind of help us stay in our homes. The whole financing system targets medical interventions, medical locations, healthcare locations, so that old folks uh, can't afford to stay in their home. The only way they can get their support for activity of daily living is to go into a highly medicalized environment, i.e. a nursing home. So another series of um, changes that we are, and the Institute of Medicine really comes down firmly in this camp that we're, we're looking at, is how can we keep people at home, bring the kind of care to the people themselves so that they don't, by default, utilize very expensive, not helpful, and often dangerous care simply because they need help. How, how does one apply the lessons in pause to dealing with one's physicians? Particularly, I mean, if one is blessed with a primary care physician who one likes, and I happen to be blessed with him, but I don't like the institution he works in or for. Uh, I'm 74, incidentally, so this is very pressing. But, uh, but let's say you have to go to, you know, you get a heart attack and you have to go to... to, to mm -hmm. How can you... Is there a way to gently, practically, usefully mm -hmm. press this process on some yeah. other people? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I'm sorry, Mike Mansfield, that is, but I got to go on. I got to go on. <clears throat> Here are a couple of ways in, in which you can do that. And that is if over the years you have become skilled at when you are in a situation. This is not when you're in the ER and they're pounding on your chest. This, this is not it. This is not a good place to have a liberal arts seminar. But if you've done your work ahead of time, uh, and maybe you've talked to your family. So either you or your family says, okay, so here's what he said is important to him. And then you come to, or you're in this situation, you've just gotten a diagnosis, and you think, now, what really matters to me now? If you'd asked me 20 years ago, if this happened to you, what would you want? Probably your answer would be very different than what it is when you actually find yourself in that situation. So the first thing is, when you're in a situation and you've gotten the diagnosis, pause and just kind of look around and say, hmm, what matters to me now? Uh, what matters to me about where I get my care? Uh, whom I want to be involved in that? Um, what do I really hope for? Do I hope for another five years? Do I hope for really good pain relief? Do I hope for care that keeps my mind as sharp as possible? What matters to me? What matters most? Yeah. What matters most? And so, okay, so, mm, doctor, I've done this work in my own head. Let me tell you what matters most to me. Now, you're the expert in what's going on with my body and what the possible treatments are. So, given what I've just told you matters most to me, 
which of those treatments do you think is most likely to um, honor that top value? Another really important thing is, based on what matters to you, you want to, you want to run a test. Now, why are you running this test? Is it going to possibly change what you and I would decide, or do you just want to know? So, if you just want to know, but it's not going to change your behavior, don't do it. So, I guess the question is, you have to, you have to believe that the person you're talking to, who is a medical professional, wants to hear this. Do you think that's true? I go in with the assumption that these are professionals who want to do a good job, who want to take good care of me. They have their areas of expertise. That does not include, generally, what matters most to me. Yeah. I'm the expert on myself. Yeah. And they value expertise. Now, there are, you know, real sons of guns in all professions who <laughs> don't who don't care. But I don't go in with that assumption. I go in with the assumption that these are people who want to provide good care to me. And a missing piece that only I or my decision makers can provide is what matters to me. And my experience has been that when Mike and I and our daughter did that, they were immensely grateful, and they would themselves sort of slow down. They would pause and say, well, let's, let's talk about that. But if you don't give them that information and that opportunity, of course they're going to go with what they know and what their past experience tells them. It is up to us to manage that piece of expertise. That is wonderful. Oh, what a great, what a great way of looking at it. And thinking about it. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a, an honor and a joy and hope we can have you back again as, as time permits and, and, and life makes possible. Pleasure for me too to reconnect and after all these years to revisit some of these topics that we talked to when we were young Turks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.